Happy New Year, CyberWire listeners. Rick Howard here. Now that we're in 2023, we're so excited to bring you more ways to stay ahead in the industry with one of the leaders in cybersecurity training and our newest best friend, CyberVista. As a thank you to our listeners, we would like to offer you a free CyberVista practice test as well as three free months of CyberWire Pro. Three free months and a practice test? That's a great deal. Visit thecyberwire.com slash promo. That's the cyberwire.com slash promo and use the code ProLearn, all one word. That's P R O L E A R N to redeem this limited time offer. This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by Strider Technologies. Strider is the first strategic intelligence tool built to help companies, government agencies, and research institutions protect their innovation and compete in a new era of global strategic competition. With trillions of open source data points, Strider's technology and intelligence solutions enable you to proactively identify, manage, and respond to state-sponsored intellectual property theft and supply chain risks. Learn how to secure your technology talent and supply chains at striderintel.com. GitHub disables no-name accounts. Russia dismisses reports of cyber espionage attempts against U.S. national laboratories. The Royal Mail cyber incident is now identified as ransomware attacks. An update on the NOTAM issue that interfered with civil aviation. A Citrix vulnerability is exploited by a ransomware group. CISA publishes its annual report. Brian Vorndren of the FBI Cyber Division calibrates our expectations with regards to the IC3. Our guest is Kane McGladry with insights on 2023 from the IEEE. And positive hack days and the growing isolation of Russia's cyber sector. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, January 13th, 2023. We begin with some updates to stories we've seen break earlier this week. The first two come from the cyber phases of Russia's war against Ukraine. First, GitHub has taken down accounts associated with the Russian hacktivist auxiliary group No Name 05716. Again, we are simply going to refer to them as No Name. CyberScoop quotes a GitHub representative stating, We disabled the accounts in accordance with GitHub's acceptable use policies, which prohibit posting content that directly supports unlawful active attacks or uses GitHub as a means to deliver malicious executables. Like so many other Russian auxiliaries, No Name has specialized in DDoS attacks, and it's crowed high over them in its Telegram channel. The group's New Year's greetings show some representative crowing, stating... Did any of us know at the start of the year that something like this would happen? Did we, ordinary programmers and difficult guys from the darknet, know that we would need to go to the real and digital frontiers? Did anyone know that the issues of protecting the motherland and the re-education of the civilized world would be carried out by us as well? The no-names ask rhetorically, No, no, no one knew but the current situation has divided everything into before and after. We don't know how long the NWO will last, how many spears will break, and how many bumps will hit. One thing we know for sure, we will win. We will definitely win. Even if the whole world is against us, they will lose for one simple reason. The right guys are not with them, and it's total. Holiday greetings. We all have strength and perseverance. There is nowhere to retreat. There will be no other motherland. Well, that's one way of looking at it. In another note from the cyber front, Russia has taken exception to Reuters' report last week that the Cold River Group has the Kremlin's fingerprints on it. 
Cold River, widely believed to operate on behalf of a Russian intelligence and security service, probably the FSB, has attempted to compromise workers at the U.S. Brookhaven, Argonne, and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. Maria Zakharova, Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman, harumphed yesterday in a press briefing, the latest pseudo-investigation was unfortunately published by Reuters news agency. There was no evidence given, no facts, she added, but did not further elaborate. Reuters stands by its story, as indeed Reuters should. Our third update concerns the disruption of Britain's Royal Mail Service. Those disruptions to the UK's Royal Mail Service, first reported on Wednesday as a cyber incident, has now been identified as a ransomware attack linked to the Russian-affiliated Lockbit Gang, computing reports today. The Telegraph broke the news of the confirmed ransomware attack yesterday with attribution to Lockbit, or an actor using the gang's encryptor. The attack was behind the encryption of devices used for shipping internationally, and ransom notes were reportedly printed on printers intended for custom dockets. The ransom note claims to be Lockbit Black Ransomware, with links to Tor sites used by Lockbit operators and a decryption ID said by multiple security researchers to be unusable, Bleeping Computer confirmed yesterday. When Bleeping Computer reached out for comment, Lockbit Support claimed that the gang did not attack Royal Mail and they blamed it on other threat actors using their leaked builder. There is no end in sight to service disruption, stressed a Royal Mail spokesperson, the BBC reported last night. Computing writes this morning that the FAA continues to attribute Wednesday's NOTAM outage to a damaged database file. A source speaking to CNN claimed that air traffic controllers recognized the system issue on Tuesday afternoon, intending to reboot the system during less congested hours on Wednesday morning. The reboot took place as planned, though the system still wasn't completely pushing out the pertinent information that's needed for safe flight, and it appeared that it was taking longer to do that, according to CNN's source, which led to the eventual grounding order. A senior government official cited aging infrastructure as a contributing factor, noting that the system is 30 years old and not scheduled to be updated for another six years, according to NBC News. In the long-running disruption of the UK news service The Guardian, the paper has confirmed that it sustained a ransomware attack last month. The Guardian Media Group's CEO Anna Bateson and The Guardian's editor-in-chief Catherine Viner sent an email to employees on Wednesday stating that the firm had suffered a highly sophisticated cyber attack involving unauthorized third-party access to parts of their network. The attackers were able to access personal data of the company's U.K. employees. Graham Cluley explains that the data included names, addresses, dates of birth, national insurance numbers, bank account details, salary information, and identity documents, such as passports. This morning, researchers at security firm At Bay reported that they have reason to believe a critical Citrix vulnerability is being exploited by the Royal Ransomware Gang. Citrix disclosed CVE 2022-27510 on November 8, 2022. The vulnerability allows for the potential bypass of authentication measures on two Citrix products, the application delivery controller and gateway. At Bay researchers last week observed what appears to be the first known exploitation of the flaw in the wild. The researchers recommend that organizations apply Citrix's patches and mitigations as soon as possible. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency yesterday released 12 industrial control system advisories. The agency also released its 2022 year in review. The report is organized into four topical sections cyber defense, risk reduction and resilience, operational collaboration, and agency unification. On that final point, the report explains foundational to our success. The agency is unifying as one CISA through integrated functions, capabilities, and workforce. The agency is building a culture of excellence based on core values and core principles that prize teamwork and collaboration, innovation and inclusion, ownership and empowerment, transparency and trust. 
Brookings offers some reflection on last May's Positive Hack Days, the annual conference organized by the Russian security firm Positive Technologies, a company now under U.S. sanctions for its cooperation with Russian intelligence services. The essay sees an increasingly isolated cyber ecosystem in which the Russian cyber sector has now become a closed system with aspirations to self-sufficiency. The aforementioned Maria Zakharova called it the creation of a multipolar world, which is, as we've said before, one way of looking at it. Monday is the U.S. holiday that honors Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and the CyberWire won't be publishing that day. We'll be back as usual on Tuesday. In the meantime, best wishes on the occasion to all who will be observing the holiday with us. Coming up after the break, Brian Vordren from the FBI Cyber Division calibrates our expectations with regard to the IC3. Our guest is Kane McGladry with insights on 2023 from the IEEE. Stay with us. And now, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. There's a reason more than half of today's ransomware victims end up paying the ransom. Cyber criminals have become thoughtful taking time to maximize your organization's potential damage and their payoff. After achieving root access, the bad guys explore your network, reading email, finding data troves, and once they know you, they craft a plan to cause the most panic, pain, and operational disruption. Ransomware has gone nuclear. The folks at Know Before have an on-demand webinar that will get you up to speed on ransomware. In this webinar, you'll find out why data backups, even offline backups, won't save you, why ransomware isn't your real problem, and how your end users can become your best last line of defense. Go to knowbefore.com slash ransom to learn more about the webinar. That's K-N-O-W-B-E numeral four dot com slash R-A-N-S-O-M. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show. And now, a word from our sponsor, Strata. With multi-cloud, your apps and identities are distributed, making them hard to manage and secure. Strata takes all of your existing identity systems, integrates them into an identity fabric, a universal way for all your IDPs to work together. Never refactor your apps again. Never get locked into your IDP with one-to-one connectors. Identity orchestration helps you solve your biggest IAM problems, even the messy ones you thought were unsolvable. Bring Strata any IAM use case, like modernizing legacy apps to use passwordless authentication, hot switching between IDPs, or enabling identity operation resiliency. Strata's flexible, lightweight, and distributed architecture software is designed to extend the value of your identity infrastructure, no matter the complexity or scale. Share your time on a discovery call, and Strata will send you custom AirPods Pro. The multi-cloud identity wave is here, and you can ride it with Strata. Ready to learn more? Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. And we thank Strata Identity for sponsoring our show. Kane McGladry is field CISO at Hyperproof and is a senior member of the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. They recently released a global study titled The Impact of Technology in 2023 and Beyond. I checked in with Kane McGladry for the details. Cybersecurity concerns have really increased overall since uh, since last year's report. Um, cloud vulnerability, for example, I think last year only 35% of people thought that cloud vulnerabilities were a concern. This year it's over half, it's 51%. Or uh, mobile hybrid workforce is uh, an enduring concern, actually. It's up to 46%, which was uh, last year 39%. And that's interesting because... 
work from home is not necessarily new. I just think that for budgetary purposes, many companies might have thought, oh, that'll be over soon. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then the final one uh, I found to be particularly interesting is around data center vulnerabilities. Uh, And if we get really deep into the data uh, underpinning the survey, that seems to be mostly from China. Whereas if you think uh, domestically in the United States, the predominant number of companies have moved to the cloud and to a hybrid working model. Oh, that is interesting that there would be a a regional uh, uh, difference there. Yeah, it is. And um, I think it might speak really to defensibility as well. And um, if you think about it, when you look at data centers, they're feeling a little antiquated at the moment. Um, Given how many companies are moving to the cloud, that's causing a lot of vendors to update their tooling and technology and defensive mechanisms to be predominantly on, on cloud. And so... The concern would be if you are still running on-premises hardware and services, it's at some point your vendor may no longer support those and it becomes an incrementally harder situation to actually defend those with any level of adequacy. Yeah, that's interesting. Kind of, uh, you know, the get on the bandwagon or, or you, this, this train is leaving the station, right? You don't want to miss it. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's where a lot of the vendor investment is going. And I think also that's where a lot of the um, cybersecurity frameworks and associated regulatory controls are moving towards is the recognition that uh, we used to do things that way. That was neat back in the back in the day when we used to have big iron on premises and you could stand up Windows servers and not secure them and then have a breach. That wasn't so bad. These days, that's no longer considered to be acceptable by organizations and your regulatory entity will also uh, beat you about the ears if you have that occur. Well, in terms of cybersecurity professionals, what are some of the other things that rose to the top here? Um, So cloud vulnerabilities was definitely the number one, and I think that's really the narrative on software supply chain that we first saw hit the news in, like, mainstream news when uh, SolarWinds occurred and then Log4J, where a lot of companies are starting to look in their supply chain and say, how much do we actually trust you? And um, we're seeing a lot of companies request a SOC 2 Type 2 report as proof that, hey, you're doing the cybers okay. Uh, But also in a lot of cases, that's pushing SaaS vendors to be pushed towards uh, FedRAMP uh, low-impact SaaS or FedRAMP moderate, not necessarily because they're doing business with the company, but or with the government, I should say, but rather because, hey, it's hard to go get. Uh, And so if you're doing that well, you must be doing cybersecurity very well. The other thing that we've seen is that increase in hybrid and mobile workforce and concerns around there. And that comes to companies needing to really invest and continue to invest in adequate controls and, and measuring the effectiveness of this. And that that's not just for cybersecurity controls. Um, if you've got something like, uh, if you look at data loss controls, which are not necessarily considered to be cybersecurity, uh, there have been many studies showing that as employees are working more from their home devices, you can have uh, those information leak onto those personal devices. And if that employee is considering departing, they might take that information with them. And if that's financial information that they could conduct inside trades on, or if that's um, proprietary information that they could sell to a competitor or take to a competitor, or even a sales book, really, um, those all become material concerns that companies have to cover down on. Whereas previously, when everyone was inside the magical office and there was the super cool firewall around it, somehow that we all put our heads in the sand and pretended that that didn't happen. You mentioned that this is an annual study that you all release. Are are there any long-term trends that you're tracking here that you can see to to give us some insights on the direction we might be headed? Um, I think that if we look at the larger technology stack, I think that's illustrative towards where the world is moving. So in 2022, for example, and in prior years, we've seen cloud and uh, wireless technologies be continuing trends that are popular. Of course, initially it was 4G, this year it was 5G, as obviously we've added yet another G to that stack. Um, But also things like the investment in electric vehicles has been increasing as those have become more commercially viable. And of course, when you think about electrical vehicles and the underpinning infrastructure of those, um, that becomes now an interesting question of how do you ensure that your users have security and privacy associated with those technologies. Um, I think one that 
may be a um, – it, it shows up and then it goes away and it shows up again is around augmented reality, virtual reality, and the metaverse. Um, I know that when we conducted this study in September of this year, metaverse was was predicted to be one of the most important technologies in 2023. Um, I think since the collapse of FTX and the continued um, bear market in the crypto markets in general, uh, Metaverse, which is almost entirely blockchain-backed, is going to perhaps not be as important as would have been initially predicted when you look at the study. That's Kane McGladry from Hyperproof. The IEEE's report is titled... The IEEE's report is titled The Impact of Technology in 2023 and Beyond. You can find a link to that in today's show notes. There's a lot more to this conversation. If you want to hear more, head on over to the CyberWire Pro and sign up for Interview Selects, where you'll get access to this and many more extended interviews. I'm pleased to be joined once again by Brian Vorndren. He is Assistant Director of the Cyber Division at the FBI. Uh, Director Vorndren, thank you for joining us uh, here once again. I I wanted to touch base with you today on the IC3, which is uh, the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center. Kind of set expectations. What exactly uh, is the IC3 best used for? uh, And what can you tell our audience about the best ways to make use of it? Dave, thanks for inviting me back. And it's a really good question and one that we receive quite routinely. What I would say is this. IC3 was uh, initially implemented about 20 years ago when internet-enabled, computer-enabled fraud uh, became a thing. And so certainly over those two decades, it has continued to grow and serve a meaningful platform, meaningful role in that it is a consolidation point for not only an internet-enabled, computer-enabled fraud, but it has also become a very, very heavily utilized reporting center for traditional cyber intrusions. When we look broadly across the data set, I would say between two-thirds and three-quarters of the data reported to IC3 still is computer and internet-enabled fraud, victimization complaints, and the other balance, 25% to a third, is traditional cyber intrusions. Uh, We always have thought that it's important to have one consolidated location for American citizens, whether corporate citizens or individual citizens, to have a a, a place to report uh, these crimes to. But I do think that um, IC3's role Uh, can never replace the role of an actual human contact. And so we do always encourage corporations and organizations to really maintain an ongoing robust relationship with their actual cyber squad of their cyber investigative squad or the field office of wherever they're based. Um, And that's really important because that cyber squad can become an active point, an active center of gravity for any organization to share cyber threat intelligence. But more importantly, it's really important to have that relationship in place if an organization does become a victim. So we do encourage corporations and organizations to report to IC3 because it does serve as that consolidated point of data. But we also think it's actually just as important, if not more important, for organizations and corporations to have an ongoing relationship with their cyber investigative squad in their area that they reside, whether that's a major city or a smaller city. You know, one of the things we say is that every organization should have an active relationship with their FBI field office. They should have that point of contact written into their incident response plan, and they should actually exercise their incident response plan with their FBI POC in the office with them at that time. So hopefully, Dave, that gives you a little bit to think about in your audience, a little bit to think about about IC3's historic role, their current role, um, and then how that balances out with actually having a human contact. 
Is it fair to say that the IC3 tends to be a little more consumer facing where whereas the, the the direct relationships with the field offices tends to be at more of a professional level? I think that's fair. I would want to give it a little bit more context and say that you know we would love, you know, we're we're a victim-centered organization. That's what we pride ourselves on. It's been the backbone of the organization for more than more than a century. But it's simply impossible for us to scale to every business who has two or three people or an individual household compromise of a computer. We would love to because that's what's in our DNA, but we just don't have the resources to do it. And so IC3 can serve as a very meaningful portal for those type of individuals to report to or those types of small organizations to report to and know that they're doing their part to facilitate an understanding of the larger threat picture. Whereas for corporations or larger organizations, the FBI can scale to have personal and professional relationships with them and be actively involved with those organizations prior to an intrusion and during an intrusion. So hopefully that additional context helps round out the understanding. Yeah, it absolutely does. Brian Vorndren is Assistant Director of the FBI's Cyber Division. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making The CyberWire possible. Find out more about sponsoring our programs at thecyberwire.com slash sponsor. And that's The CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Be sure to check out this weekend's Research Saturday and my conversation with Mohammed Kazem Hassan Najad from With Secure's team. We're discussing their research, Ducktail Returns, underneath the ruffled feathers. That's Research Saturday. Do check it out. The CyberWire podcast is a production of N2K Networks, proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Liz Irvin, Rachel Gelfand, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Maria Varmatsis, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Millie Lardy, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Catherine Murphy, Janine Daly, Jim Hoshite, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, Simone Petrella, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible by RSA Conference, where the world talks security. Through global events and year-round content, RSAC connects you to cybersecurity leaders and cutting-edge ideas for a safer, more secure future. Learn more at rsaconference.com slash cyberwire23.